OK, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to um, the second in our series of fireside chats um, on global voices on security um, here at the Institute for Security Science and Technology. Um, before we kick off, um, just a quick introduction to the Institute for Security Science and Technology. We're a research um, institute um, centred in Imperial College London. Um, and what we're really interested in is how science and technology is impacting the world of security and defence, how it is helping to solve some of the problems in security, but more importantly, how we can use science and technology in order to create more stable, sustainable security and uh, global security and peace so that we don't actually end up in situations of conflict. So we're quite interested in a very broad uh, range of topics, as you can imagine, related to, to security and insecurity. And this series of talks is meant to be a catch up with some thought leaders around the world to give us different global perspectives on security and insecurity and how they view technology solutions and technology as playing a part um, in the whole debate. So today we're very, um, uh, I'm very honoured to be joined by um, uh, our guest um, who is a technology um, entrepreneur amongst many other things, um, Angela Lungati from Kenya, um, uh, from Nairobi is calling us from, Ken uh, from Nairobi today. Um, and Angela is a technologist, a community builder, an open software advocate. Um, and Angela has a passion, has had a passion for a long time about building and using appropriate technology tools to create an impact in the lives of marginalized groups. Um, she has over a decade of experience in software development, global community engagement and uh, non-profit organizational management. And currently Angela serves as executive director for a company called Ushahidi, which is a global non-profit uh, technology company that builds tools for democratizing information, increasing transparency and lowering barriers for individuals to raise their voices. So extremely important and topical area for us to discuss today with Angela. But that's not the end of what Angela does. Uh, she's previously served as, as the Director of Community Engagement, um, creating and managing programs for Ushahidi's diverse global community. Um, and she is also the co-founder of Akira Chicks, which is a non-profit organization that is hoping and is helping to nurture and drive the next generation of women um, in STEM subjects in order to develop innovations and solutions for Africa. So Angela, I hope I got most of that right. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing bio um, and I might just hand it over to you to just fill in any of the missing gaps that I might have uh, I might have missed out. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the no gaps you put in there. I think that was a that was a very apt description of me and the work that I do. Um, and I'm just really glad to be able to to join you today and um, just share my insights from my own experience um, at Ushahidi. So thank you for the invitation. No, you're very welcome. As I said, it's our honor to have you here. Yeah. And Angela, you know, you and I have talked a little bit um, over the last few months about how open source software, et cetera, has, and open sourcing generally has empowered people to solve problems. Um, and for those people who don't speak Kiswahili, maybe you could explain a bit um, what Ushahidi means and what is the origin story of Ushahidi and this platform? What is it? What does it do? Uh, what is what has it achieved so far? OK, um, so Ushahidi is a Swahili word that means testimony. Um, we are an organization that was born out of the post-election violence that broke out in Kenya back in 2007-2008. Um, I think the backstory behind that is that um, there were the elections in 2007 were marked by very high tribal tensions. So, of course, when results were announced, they were primarily contested, <clears throat> excuse me, resulting in the breakout of violence across the country. Now, mm -hmm. back then, a lot of what was happening on the ground was primarily underreported or not reported at all. And so a group of five Kenyan bloggers who are the Ushahidi founders then came together to help ordinary Kenyans to shed light into what was happening around them. Um, so it could be that there's violence outside my house or, you know, there's a church burning, things like that. Um, so the founders basically built a platform where ordinary people could send in text messages or could fill out a web form 
and have that information aggregated and visualized on a map. So what that did was essentially give Kenyans a voice when no one else could or would. Um, and citizen witnesses became empowered to document violence that was happening in their communities, share this information globally, you know, even for people who are not in their country, and where possible, feed that data to domestic and international investigators, as well as prosecutors working towards accountability for crimes. So really just using it as a way of creating a better situational awareness about the atrocities that were going on and having that lead to some sort of um, change uh, as a result. Now, that was you no know, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, right. Now we, we, we refer to ourselves as, or that we think of ourselves as a global nonprofit technology company that builds integrated tools and services to empower people to generate solutions and mobilize communities for good. Um, our flagship crowdsourcing platform is known as, the, it's called the Ushahidi platform and is used by individuals, NGOs, nonprofits, as well as enterprises to rapidly collect and act on data to help them strengthen communities uh, um, as well as help them thrive. That's amazing. And it must have yes. been, um, I mean, maybe you can explain to us some of the challenges of setting something like that up from scratch. I mean, particularly, it's difficult enough to set up a kind of startup in a new business anyway, but under those conditions, um, and probably in a situation where that sort of platform had never been created before in in Kenya, um, and maybe even in an African context, maybe maybe you can explain to us some of the, some of the challenges that you faced in, in setting something like that up. So to, to also be clear, I wasn't, I mean, I joined the organization probably two, two or three years after it had begun. Um, but I think when I, and this is from the conversations we've had with the founders and thinking about why, why they even set it up in the first place. I think one of the biggest challenges back then was probably um, being able to, or rather, when they began, the focus was purely on figuring out how to scratch an itch, solve the mm -hmm. problem the communities right the yeah. immediate thought was we need to figure out a way to help ordinary kenyans be able to uh, share their voice and just you know clearly indicate exactly what's going on um and then as time went by because there was this wave of you know the internet connectivity around the world people getting access to platforms for self-expression this idea of looking at a bottom-up approach to collection of data then kind of really sprung out um, into the minds of many people and so they started getting a lot of requests from everywhere hey we saw what happened in kenya we saw how you use this platform how can we get to do the same thing and i think back yeah. then the question then was how do you get this tool or rather how do you make this tool as accessible to as many Many people as possible and I think that's where the idea of creating something that was open source then really sprang out right making sure that there are no barriers to somebody being able to take the platform deploy it customize it and use it for their own for their own individual use case and then as time went by the other challenges started to pop up which is so yes you've you've factored in the idea of accessibility in terms of just picking the software itself but how about things like um, accessibility in terms of language. We all know that primarily people tend to um, communicate in English, but that's not the first language for many groups around the world. So how do you then make it available in as many languages as possible? And I think the fact that the tool was open source then made it much easier for people to be able to come in and contribute. You had people from, you know, whether it's Latin American speaking countries or French or uh, uh, Chinese or Arabic, just coming in and then contributing and being able to help uh, translate the platform into as many languages um, as possible. Um, as we continue to grow, um, the challenge then shifted from accessibility into, okay, as a nonprofit, then how do you make sure that this work is sustainable? And yeah. there's various challenges around that. And I think this, this is a problem that's not unique just to Ushahidi. There's very many uh, organizations that are focused on social impact that will probably have this challenge. How do you keep the lights on and how do you build a sustainable business model around the work that you're doing that will not take you away from what your core work is, but then still allow you to be able to generate some revenue to keep to keep things going. And, and you know, we could probably dive into a deeper rabbit hole in there, but it's, it's still something that um, as an organization we're trying to figure out, but um, that would probably be one of the biggest challenges in our journey. Yes, and I, yeah, that is a that's a face. It's a problem that many many founders and startups face, right? That that careful yep. balance. And I recognise yep. that. 
<clears throat> you mentioned all of these, the, the different languages and translations then. I mean, you're deployed, I guess, is, is that right? In more than 150 countries have seen the Ushahidi platform deployment. Um, yes. I, I wondered if you could just sort of give us a, a broader perspective on the kind of applications that you've had. I understand the Haiti earthquake in 2010, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Nepal earthquake in 2015. Mm -hmm. These were all, the platform was used in all of these different circumstances? Yeah, absolutely. So from that initial instance of Ushahidi for the Kenyan election in 2007, in the last 13 years, it's grown to be used more than 200,000 times in over 160 countries, gathering more than 50 million reports in four main categories of social impact. So of course, that very first one was, I think you could look at it as both um, election monitoring, but mostly crisis response. Um, yeah. And I think over time that ended up being one of the biggest, the biggest use cases that Ushahid is known for. Like you mentioned, the Haiti earthquake, the Zenepal earthquake, and most recently for COVID-19, this idea of using our platform or our technology tools to collect fast hand information from people who are directly affected uh, by crises to inform humanitarian response. So using it as a way of connecting people in need with those who could actually help. So groups like the Red Cross and other humanitarian um, organizations. Um, the second category is, is human rights protection. Um, so using it as a way of documenting um, things just again from you know as a first-hand experience um, to create awareness about human rights violations around the world. Some major examples that come to mind is one that was has been used in Egypt for a number of years since 2010, um, track, yeah. tracking sexual harassment against women. Um, you know it was also used to document the protests during the Egyptian Revolution of 2010. Uh, most recently in 2018, publishing news from the Iranian protests um, to even as, uh, as, as recently as uh, 2020, documenting police brutality in Portland during the Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter protests. Um, the other category, the third one, is good governance. So looking at using data and you know that citizen engagement to help hold duty bearers to account and uphold the integrity of elections and democracies around the world. So one of the other really big use cases that people know Shahidi for is election monitoring. It's been used in Kenya, I think three times since that first deployment for our constitutional referendum in 2010, the elections in 2013, um, and then twice in 2017. I'm, for, for those who don't know, in 2017, we actually had two elections in a span of about three months because um, the presidential results announced the, the presidential results um, that were announced in August of 2017 ended up being annulled, and so we had to go back to the ballot. Um, so for those two instances, we did deploy the platform for that. But outside the Kenyan context, used in the USA, used in Tanzania, in Zambia, um, I believe in the Congo as well. So there's many, many other groups um, out there who've, you know, looked at using an open source platform, our open source platform to um, really mobilize ordinary people to protect their votes by them being able to raise their voice. Um, and then last but not least, the fourth category is environmental justice. So looking at supporting fair treatment and meaningful involvement of people in being able to develop, implement and enforce environmental laws. Um, one of the biggest examples that pops up there for me is um, one that's been that had has been tracking the effects of the oil spill crisis um, in Louisiana. So yeah, the Louisiana Bucket Brigade. They've been using the yeah. platform just to track exactly what the ecological impact has been and use that to inform policy policy changes. So, yeah. It's amazing uh, the, the breadth of the different things the platform has been used for. Um, yeah. I wondered if, I, I was quite interested to know how you got stakeholders to use that data to engage with it and then, you know, make decisions around it. I mean, has that been a challenge? I mean, you sort of just, I guess Bushahidi just sort of sprung up and just started mm -hmm. generating insights and data. Um, mm -hmm. The next step is to make people do something with it. How, how was that achieved? So I think what one one thing to to always keep in mind is that technologies are really helpful and big piece in being able to create change, but it's not the only solution. And so there's a lot of offline work that also has to happen. Right. And the, the starting point of that, like when I look at some of the most successful examples of where Ushahidi has been used and has actually helped to create change, 
um, one of the key ingredients is having a very clear understanding of what the problem is, right? And then the second thing is figuring out how the technology fits in helping to solve that problem. Third thing is understanding who the audience actually is, right? Which is basically understanding who exactly would be the stakeholders in this, who would be contributing to the data, who will actually be making use of the data, and in what form does that need to be presented to them, right? That will then influence what strategies you use to then, um, whether it's create awareness um, or drive or drive change. So those, those have tended to be some of the biggest pieces that have then helped to um, figure out how to create that change, making sure you have the right stakeholders in place, and then clearly communicating and managing expectations around what happens when I, as Angie, come and share information on the platform. How is that feedback loop closed? Because what we realized over time, and I think it's something that we, we generally know in the world, the key to behavioral change actually does lie in feedback loops. Right. Yeah. If I send a text message today about there being a problem in my community and action is taken fairly quickly, then that will inspire me to continue to raise my voice, to continue to share that information. I'll also be much more likely to go tell my friends that, hey, when I did this, this happened. And so that will then you know, start this big spiral of more and more people being encouraged to, to take part in, in solving problems in their communities. Yeah, because I've seen you, you know, I've seen you give talks on TED and various places like that. And there's a lot of personal um, passion and energy, I guess, that you've got to bring to evangelizing for the outputs and making people listen. Um, yeah. And, and I, I, the reason I was asking that question is because to me, it seems that in some cases you're going to be revealing some inconvenient truths for people. Right. I mean, there's not necessarily the case that everybody is in love with the data <laughs> that's being revealed. Um, and, yeah. and, and in many cases, I guess those are the people you want to actually then do something with it. Um, so that must have been quite that must have been quite difficult to achieve in the early days. And, and maybe now it's easier. I don't know. But um, no. is, it, is, it, is it an ongoing challenge to do that, to get that? I, get that to I would have yeah, I would actually say it's probably an ongoing challenge. So one of the first things to also clearly make a distinction around is the role that Ushahidi plays. So there are very few instances where we get involved in actually managing the data in, you know, like deploying the platform and collecting it. And that's specifically the Kenyan elections and then a couple of implementation projects. But typically the role we see ourselves playing is um, providing access to data and providing access to the technology. So we'll build the tool and then make it available to ordinary people, to activists and NGOs to then go ahead and, and, and deploy that. And um, the reason why I said that I, I think it's an ongoing challenge is because even in some of the even in some of the cases where you have really strong relationships established, it's still very difficult to make sure that all of you are able to speak to one voice and come together with, you know, towards a common goal. And it doesn't mean that there the, the, the aren't possibilities there. It's just that it's a very fine balance when you're building relationships because yes, you can have a common goal, but there's still other motivations that other people will have, right? And so it takes a lot, a lot of work to make sure that there's a very clear identification of the common goal that brings all the stakeholders involved, that makes it very clear what everybody's responsibilities are, and then tie all of those in together. Um, a classic example that I would give is, for example, in the Kenyan election case, right? For that to be meaningful change, when you're talking about protecting people's votes, there's various factors you have to take into consideration. Um, you have to think about those who come in and share information about, um, you know, election malpractices, who does that information go to? And then who acts? Who's responsible for doing that? There might be pieces around security as well. And so that means that even before setting up the project, you have to have identified is, you know, is it the, um, the IEBC? Is it the Red Cross? Is it the Human Rights Commission's ETC? And then how do you then communicate the value of them working with you to then yeah. get them on board? Um, so, it's in theory. The, when I speak about it, it seems like it's easy, but on the ground, it's it it, it it tends to be quite a bit of work, quite a bit of work. But it it is the key. It it tends to be the key to to having successful projects. Yeah, <clears throat> that's. I mean, it's very impressive. As I said, that's the part that really 
it hits me when I think about all the things you've done is how you've managed to achieve that. And we've got maybe a, a tiny insight from your answer there on how you've managed <laughs> to do that. And and I guess the challenge must have been, so you guys recently deployed also under the last 12 months of COVID, et cetera. Ushahidi has been used in the, in the COVID context as well, correct? Yes, absolutely. So um, that's actually a very interesting um, use case that we we honestly didn't see it growing as much as much as it did during that time. Because I remember when, um, I think it was around March. Yes, COVID had been around for maybe four months, um, but at the point where, uh, you know, many more countries around the world were getting hit, like when Spain was going into lockdown, um, and then other African countries also began to do the same thing. I remember us sitting down and asking ourselves, this is one of the biggest crises that we've ever experienced in our lifetimes. What can we do to help? And it, we honestly didn't have that figured out at that time. Um, and then suddenly, as time went by, it wasn't us figuring out what we should do, but more of ordinary people coming in and saying, I want to use Shahidi for this, for that, for this and that. And we're like, wow, okay. Um, we saw, like, literally, it wasn't your typical NGOs or the Red Crosses. It was uh, an Angie or a Deep or, you know, a Sam sitting in the community saying, I can see a problem and I want to figure out how to help. And so a lot of the use cases we saw were things like um, mutual aid groups. So whether it's connecting, you know, helping people who are high risk or more vulnerable get access to food or get access to essential medicines. There were others who, because there was such little information that was being given at that time, tracking the progression of the disease, right? Um, and then there were some cases where some organizations were coming in and saying, we can see that some of our governments are struggling and we want to see if the information we can collect here will help to inform some of the things they need to do. For example, um, collecting or documenting people's um, experiences, trying to get access to testing and right now trying to get access to vaccines and seeing if that would then create visibility into we need to dedicate our resources on testing in this region and that region and that region. And so in those 12 to 16 months of COVID being around, um, we've seen the platform specifically deployed for COVID-19 response over 1900 times in more than 140 countries. Now wow. we are a team of um, 11 to 13 people and we were inundated, with, like there were requests coming in from every part of the world, all coming in at the same time. So all hands on deck took a completely new meaning for all of us. I think at some point, every person on the team was probably speaking to a user or a community, trying to help them just structure or figure out how to set up their platform in a really good way to then help them out. And that was including our finance team. So um, overall, it was, I guess you could say that COVID came with its silver lining because it also really validated what we've been communicating a lot over our journey, which is the power of collective intelligence and the importance of including ordinary people in problem solving. Um, even before the likes of Ushahidi came, came in, um, it's been very clear that coming out of this crisis will take collective responsibility. And so that means that there needs to be a link between the decision makers and the people who are acting with the ones who are affected and everybody else in between. And so it's very important for those avenues and those platforms for that kind of engagement to happen, to exist. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that Ushahidi exists and I can see how with, with, with more of this realization coming out to the world, why we need to continue existing. So, I mean, that leads me on to a really uh, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about. And I, I think this idea of global security and by the way, just for everybody who's listening, you know, we're not just talking about deployments on, for COVID-19 in Kenya mm -hmm. or in Africa. We, there's been deployments around the world, right, to help with the, the COVID crisis. Um, yes. So I, th I think this idea of connectivity, innovation, open source, information freedom, being an integral part of global security is a very powerful sort of theme and you guys have sort of delivered un under that theme. Um, mm -hmm. How important do you think, maybe you could comment on that a little bit, how important do you think is it, this idea of connectivity and information freedom? How important is that to, to global security and the sort of it's a very complex complex thing, global security, right? It's not just what people mm -hmm. think about when they think about defense and security. Maybe you could comment a little bit on, on what your views are with this, with this sort of idea of interconnectivity. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of what I, you know, a lot of my opinions are probably shaped by my experience at Ushahidi. Um, and as I said before, I think it's clear that we now live in a world where um, collective responsibility is really key in solving problems in our community and security, quite honestly, in my opinion, is, is one of them. Um, I think for for those who aren't, you know, for those people in the audience who aren't a part of, of um, the African um, context, for example, for us here in Kenya, there's an initiative that's called um, Nyumbakumi. Um, that's 10, 10 houses. And I think that the goal that the government had there was for each of you to get to know 10 of your neighbors and just get to understand what's going on as a means of being able to participate in securing securing your community. Um, so I think overall, we now have platforms that help to surface information much more quickly than before, right? You don't have to wait to either hear about somebody being robbed on the television, ETC. More often than not, you get a lot on your phone, you get an alert from your friend or get an alert from social media. Um, and I think the other thing that we have, and, and that's a beautiful thing because then it helps to get people much more alert um, and also support some of the security forces that might be acting in that case. Um, I think we also have access to extens extensive data sets that can also help us to analyze identify trends and move more away well not move away but i mean yes we'll be we'll still respond but then also start to think about early warning and prevention right so talk about analyzing security incidences in a particular region over the last 10 years and see is there a shift is there a spike and then move the conversation away move the conversation more towards what is the reason for this spike or this downfall? And if there's a spike, what do we need to do to get it down? And if the, the, there is a, a fall in there, identify what those success factors were and try and see if you can apply them in, in other regions. Um, and I think overall, these are all things that have been made possible by increased connectivity, um, you know, just making these data sets easily accessible, making the information much more accessible, um, but also providing avenues for us to learn from, learn from one another, right? I live in a world where I know more about security in other counties in Kenya and other parts of the world when previously I wouldn't. I'd have to rely on information coming from the news and I mean, yes, they can, but they won't give it to you at the, the scale that the internet will. So I, I those would be that, that would be my opinion on that. So do you think, Angie, when we connect sort of the next billion people or whatever into this into this sort of digital um, global digital system? I mean, we're really building this sort of digital infrastructure here. I think this is kind of what you guys are, are playing <coughs> a major role in where you are. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. we do that, do you imagine that we will be revealing also the extent of insecurity? And learning about, you know, getting a true level and understanding of the of the problems that people face. Because as you said, I mean, from where I'm sitting, stories around security and defense, et cetera, are dominated by the, the, the kind of problems that the more wealthy countries in the world, I think, um, see as being important. Mm -hmm. I mean, is 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 there is there a role here to sort of raise the voice of people who have not had that platform before to be able to say, well, actually, there are, there are many other things. I mean, you mentioned in one of those things, you know, being able to have a, you know, access to food and, and basic resources, mm -hmm. which many people in different parts of the world take for granted and have taken Absolutely. for granted over the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that's a trend that we're going to see as the data starts revealing these these insights? Absolutely. And I'd actually say that's a trend that we're beginning to see more of right now, because there is, I think I love the fact that there, there is an acknowledgement and realization that a lot of the narratives around um, security, whether it's physical or economic, is actually being shaped from other spaces as opposed to the ones where people have the lived experience, right? Um, and there's been a much bigger shift towards figuring out how to engage with people who are directly affected to get deeper insights so that it's it's not, it's it's giving, giving a name or rather giving a face to the names or to the numbers and getting additional context in there. Right. It's not just about, hey, so there seems to be hunger here, but then figure out what is a what is a driving force there? Why is it that this community is perennially, you know, in this situation? Is it a lack of access to, to education? Is it something to do to do with health and trying to make those make those connections? Because ultimately for for there to be meaningful development, there needs to be a better understanding. And there's no one better to give you that understanding than the people who are directly involved or directly experiencing that context. There's such 
huge value in understanding that lived experience and especially now connecting these unusual suspects and getting to hear from them we'll also begin to start shaping that narrative according to what they want as opposed to what other people are defining so it's it's really important yeah that and i think that's a huge point isn't it because quite often you get this as you say external groups deciding what is best for a community not really listening to what that community actually actually needs um yeah angie i mean something else that i wanted to talk to you about and um and i'm conscious of time i think we could talk for hours anyway but um <laughs> yeah. re related to this um idea of the citizens and individuals in 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 in, in countries and states how, mm -hmm. how important do you think data sovereignty is for people as well you know owning having having ownership of that data and being able to control it can you see this as becoming an emerging emerging issue and how are you guys tackling it or thinking about it absolutely i think one of the biggest realizations we've come to we've come to in the last couple of years in our journey is that yes the world is incre getting increasingly connected but a lot of the social problems that we've been seeing continue to persist all that's happening now is that they're moving from non-digital to digital spaces that are largely unregulated and present even greater risks to the wider uh, population. Um, so I think regulation in the form of data protection laws like GDPR, and I know that there's a lot of other individual countries that are beginning to shape their own protection laws based on that example, that are helping to protect ordinary people who may be blind to the risks that they're exposed to. And I think we need to take that step a little further. So make sure that those regulations exist, but then also help people understand what their digital rights are right understand that what purpose is my personal data going to serve in this case do i have to share it and if i agree to share this information then what are the consequences how is my data being handled in the first place who is getting access to it and what happens to my data when that purpose is fulfilled yeah and, and so, I mean, I, I'm thinking about this from the context also, and I know we can't be spokesperson people for the whole of Africa. Um, that happens a lot. I see that. But but let's, yeah. let's let's just do that a little bit, I suppose. But I mean, I'm mm -hmm. thinking about the context of awareness from, you know, people generally say in the African context, how how, mm -hmm. how relevant and important is it for, for, your, for everyday person to understand this this kind of importance of their data? Because to me, there's a risk around if effectively the same thing happening with the data resource in Africa that has happened with other resources, which is, you know, mm -hmm. it just it just it can just get taken. Right. And that there isn't you know, necessarily societal awareness of it. So I wonder mm -hmm. if you think this is a is this a topic that people are people are engaging with maybe in Kenya and, and in your wider work in Africa? Is it something that everyday people realize is something important that they have to think about? I think that everyday people are beginning to talk about it a lot more. Um, and it's only from experiencing some of those risks that we risks that we're that, that we're seeing. And that's why um, I think I've been personally really advocating for we need to focus a lot more on education and sensitization. It's not just about putting the rules there, but really helping people to understand that. Um, one example that I tend to give is so um, ever since we experienced, um, you know, the, the, the spot of terrorism attacks in Kenya, one of the things that has popped up is this idea that whenever you're going into a building, you have to sign in. And most of the time, they'll ask you for a lot of information. They'll ask you for your name. They'll ask you for your phone number and they'll ask you for your identity, um, identity card number and then who you're going to see ETC. And while I can tell how certain pieces in there are important for them to be able to track in case something happens, most of us don't tend to think, OK, I just gave someone my phone number, my, identi my identity card number, as well as my name. Those are three things that are very, you know, like really key to your identity as a person. Right. And a lot of scammers are beginning to take advantage of that. And it's right. only so that the people are now wondering, OK, when I'm going, do I really have to give all of this information or what happens to those booklets? Like you'll find security guards with huge booklets of information from like four, four five, six months ago, right? And in the yeah. advent of uh, mobile money where your name and your ID number are required for you to make transactions, you know, are, are we making a connection on what risk there is? And recently I was, um, I think it was last, no, yeah, last year before the COVID um, pandemic hit, I remember that we we're having a going away dinner for a friend of mine and this building was granting access with your facial data. Now that scared me. And when I asked, okay, so why are you taking my photograph and what are you going to do with it? And the lady said, I don't know. 
And I saw a lot of people hearing me ask that question, but they didn't care and they just passed through. And that's when it hit me that this is, this is a big problem because people are still not connecting the dots and it only takes something um, bad happening for them to realize the risk that they're exposing themselves to. And when you think about the African context, it's even more dire because to, to be very frank, a lot of the vulnerable groups that we're talking about exist in these spaces. And there's a yeah. lot of data that's rightfully being collected to figure out how to support them. But in trying to support them, we might be exposing them to much bigger risks. And a lot of the time, there'll be very few people who will think about the responsibility that they, that they have in collecting and handling that data. So maybe we need to focus a lot more on explaining to these vulnerable groups and having them understand that, yes, I'm collecting this data to help you. These are the risks that are involved, but this is how I'm going to make sure that I'm protecting it. So that there's an extra layer of vigilance and not just having your data protection officers, who is one individual in a whole country who might not be able to handle it at that granular level. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 absolutely fascinating. And I, I think I think this is going to just grow and grow and yeah. into, into greater and greater problems. The interconnectivity grows and the balance between the benefits and the risks is something that <laughs> we've got to take a much more careful eye on, right? Um, listen, you, you know, full disclosure to everybody, and, and I know you know this. I mean, I was born in Nairobi, so this is this is um this conversation is very very close to my heart. And one of the things I think that we were interested in talking to you a little bit about as well, and I'd, I'd like to finish on this a little bit, is mm -hmm. that do you it, it, do you find that people are surprised to hear about the kind of innovation and the kind of platform that you guys have developed and the sort of tech scene? that comes out of places in Africa. I mean, you know, you can talk from maybe from the Nairobi con context, but I know you're doing Akira Chicks and all of this sort of stuff. I don't see enough exposure of that as a, as a story, right? You know, that actually, you know, there are there are people doing things in country to sort of um, to sort of innovate and solve problems. Is that something you find? Are people still quite surprised by that? Or is am I sort of misplaced here? And it's actually people are recognizing that, in fact, this is a there's a thing. There are people who can do stuff. I think there, there is, because the, the Kenyan tech scene has really been growing over the last decade. Um, and there's a big, there's a big, I, I would say that there's a bigger recognition of the fact that there's a lot of innovation coming from Africa. Um, and, you know, for example, the Kenyan, the, the Kenyan tech scene, the Nigerian one, the Ghanaian one. Um, but there is a challenge on the flip side, which is um, we, and I remember that th this discussion has been happening within the tech circles around owning our own narratives and not being shy about speaking about them, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, because we're living in an interconnected world, it's much easier for people to recognize that. However, I do get those instances where people are surprised, like, wow, this exists and this came out of here. But what I tend to say is like, we're not the only ones. We're not this unicorn. There's so many other amazing organizations and innovations coming out of here. So I guess it, it tends to throw the challenge back to us to um, recognize and own our wins and also start to shape those narratives and speak about it a bit more. So I think that's where the focus tends to be shifting on right now. So we're not waiting for people to come and see the work that we're doing and then speak about it, but then get into a culture of speaking speaking more about the, the successes and even the failures just so that other people can, can learn. Well, I think it's very inspiring, um, Angela. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I think we should probably probably end it there. That's a nice note to end it on. Uh, and Angie, I'm really hopeful, you know, to we'll meet in person um, soon because we haven't been able to do that because of the last 15 months. But um, yeah. and and I'm really hopeful that you know we'll be able to do some more collaboration uh, together between uh, Imperial and yourselves as well in, in in the not so distant future. But thank you so much for joining us today, and thanks for the many insights and thought-provoking things you've said over the last sort of 40 minutes or so. I'm sure people will be very interested to hear it. If anybody needs to connect with you and follow the work of Ushahidi, what's the best way for them to do that? So um, our website is ushahidi.com. Um, you can also get in touch with our support team from the contact page. Um, our Twitter handle is at ushahidi. And if you have any questions, um, my email is just my first name at ushahidi.com. So that's Angela at ushahidi.com. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, and again, I just want to say a really big thank you for hosting me uh, today. I really enjoyed this conversation and I'm definitely looking forward to meeting you in person and continuing to work together um, in the near future. It's absolutely our pleasure. Thanks again, Angie. Okay, Thanks so bye. Much. Bye.